Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios, and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfilled Radio. I am William Bell, and with me, I believe uh, he's joining me now, uh, is Don Preston. He has had some difficulty trying to get online with his computer, and I guess, you know, between the two of us, we've had our share of computer difficulties, but nevertheless, you know, we're blessed to have smartphones a couple of extra backup computers. <laughs> I think I got one, two, three, and a tablet, et cetera, and then a smartphone, and I just got a cheap Walmart smartphone. So I'm trying to stay connected as best as I possibly can, uh, but we still have these difficulties with these computers. Uh, we're grateful to be here tonight and uh, look forward to having a good study with you. I'm going to get a chat room open, which I have been failing to do consistently. Uh, later, I'm falling down on my job uh, and so need to really brush back up on my skills and make sure I'm managing the um, studio um, better than I have done in the past. Uh, I saw Don flash up on um, on the uh, on Skype, and let me see if I can let's see what his message is. Okay, he said he called in and no answer. Uh, I'll ask him to try again. Maybe he called in before I did. So we'll ask him to try again, and then um, if not, call the um, call the direct line. So you can reach the direct line at uh, 347-838-8252 if you're able to hear me. And just go ahead and call that number, and uh, we'll get you in on that line. So... We're waiting to have him in, but of course, you know, <laughs> I did take the time to listen to the broadcast. Finally got a little clear on my schedule where I had time to go back and listen to some of the Bellevue lectures. Um, it's almost like if you heard one of them, you've heard all of them. And uh, this was certainly no exception to that rule uh, and to that statement. I listened to Charles Pogue's presentation on the resurrection from John chapter 5, 28 and 29, and uh, was really uh, to just say it bluntly, unimpressed with the information that he shared, which was not much. Of course, you know, it, as we've been saying in the past several weeks, where these guys have like, I guess, 45 minutes maybe to do a speech, and it seems like Everything that oh Dunn's in, so he made it. So let's get him on. Um, see if we can get him in here. Just give me a second. All oh, right, William, Doctor, can you hear? How you doing? I can hear you now. We got you in. We got you All in. All right. Okay. Well, <laughs> one of those uh, one of those hectic situations. All of a sudden, I I mean, actually, an hour ago, uh, I was doing some reading, and I just happened to glance up at my uh, computer that I always used to call in, and it said, Windows is doing an up upgrade. It's the Windows 10. And I thought, oh, well, okay, you know, plenty of time, and it's still bumping and grinding over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, I, mean, I am... <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I I can't believe it took that long to to for it to update, and it's going through a series, oh, look what you can do now. Look what we've added, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, I don't care. I need to call in. 
Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. A lot of times, you know, when they, these upgrades happen, they affect something else and uh, really uh, throw it out of kilter. And then you got to go back and readjust, and that takes a lot of time. It's frustrating, and, you you know, you just never know where you are with some of these things. Uh, well, glad and have- thankfully, I, I'm not in your shoes where your computer crashed, so <laughs> that's the good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, you know, I mean, it was a hard drive to crash. I had, I think, three hard drives in the computer, <laughs> so two of them are still <laughs> surviving. But one of them did crash, and I had two external drives connected to the computer, so they fortunately are still working as well. So it was just a partial crash, but you know there was a lot of content on the drive that did crash. At any rate, right. uh, hopefully we're going to re- recover that data. You know when I decide whether or not I'm going to spend that much money to get it back. You know it needs to be really <laughs> good. I hope it's gold when I get it back. <laughs> At any rate. <laughs> um, we were, you know, I was just introducing the subject where we are going to talk about Charles Pogue, and I was just saying that, as we've said in previous weeks and about previous lessons from the Bellevue Lectures, that um, if you heard one of them, you've heard them all, because they're basically a regurgitation of everything. Nobody over there seems to be inspired and, and enthused about the information they have to present. It's like, wow, um, I can't believe we're having to deal with this, and you know they just say enough to say they they mentioned it in the letter in, in their messages. Uh, for the most part, is is and, you know that certainly was the impression that I got with listening to the message today. Because, I mean, if you really boil down what he said about uh, 70 A.D. in terms of substance, in the I don't know how many minutes he spoke. I didn't I didn't look at the clock on how much time he spoke. I know they ha- had about 45 minutes to speak. I think. But if you look at what he said, he probably could have got it done in less than 10 minutes, um, the substance of any argumentation that he made. Now, by comparison, I, I, was, I was reviewing um, a speech uh, by Carl Albert, you know, whom I debated back in July, where he had uh, watched our video that you and I did on the resurrection in Ardmore, after one of the Preterist Pilgrim weekends, if you recall, that video is online. I remember that, yes. So, yes. so he, he was critiquing that video, and he did a two, and I want to say maybe somewhere around 15-minute to 25-minute review of the video. And that's because he took time to play some of the excerpts from the video to let people know what I was saying and what you were saying so he wouldn't misrepresent us as best as he could manage to do that. Uh, but he still did. <laughs> and uh, so I just happened to stumble across it today, and, and I don't know what hit me. It was a bug said, look, answer some of this because it's not making a lot of sense to me. And so I did. But I uh, I had allotted myself done one hour because I had to be somewhere at 2 o'clock. So I only allotted myself an hour to speak. And then after I got into it, I think, the video ended up to be one hour and almost 30 minutes, if not 30 plus minutes. But anyway, and and that was with me only taking the first 30 minutes of his presentation, which was part of our presentation. (laughs) And I guarantee you, (laughs) I guarantee you that there is a, I mean, there's no breathing room in the in the presentation. And I'm not saying that to be boastful or anything. I'm saying if you're going to deal with this subject, you need to really understand, you know, what we're saying and, and how much depth is involved in this subject and not simply think that you can just wave a magic wand and it's going to go away. It's That's going to be the end of it because it's a lot deeper than um, these couple of passages and couple of statements, you know, that you, you know, these guys are bringing up in the Bellevue lectures. And that's just really, really sad. So, you know, and, and by the way, uh, Carl has already started trying to refute what I was refuting about, about him. <laughs> so, so I guess that's going to go on for a while, but I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to eventually try to get through the whole two hour review that he did, but I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to respond to his responses unless I hear something, you know, I, I just don't have that much time to listen to all of that. But at any rate, you know, Carl's a good guy. I appreciate him very much. 
at least he will enter. Uh, this is one thing I have to give him credit for. He will try to get into the subject and deal with the stuff that he hears. He'll even stop the tape and say, let me go back to this and let me let me deal with it. So it's not like what you hear in the Bellevue lectures, but I think he has a better a better um, understanding that he's dealing with something that isn't just a fly by night kind of kind of subject. And uh, and we're uh, we're working on some things. I had a had a conversation with another guy. We had we're working on some things that um, will continue to get this this view uh, spread even further into different communities of people, and it's already happening. And so that's that's kind of what's going on. So that's where I, I was when you came in. I was just explaining uh, that uh, scenario in terms of the fact that you know we hear these statements. And I mean, I you know, I just wrote down a quick four little points. I I had to write more with Carl's presentation than I did with Daniel Pogue's presentation, and um, Charles you know, Pogue, yes, uh, uh, with, with Charles Pogue, yeah, with his presentation. Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, Carl at least requires that you give give it a lot of in terms of what he's saying to respond. But these guys, they're making arguments done that. I mean, people in the audience should have been screaming about the inconsistency and the illogic, uh, illogical argumentation that they're presenting. I mean, what do you say when a guy gets up and says that um, the kingdom is at hand and then ignores the coming of the Lord <laughs> at hand? You see, that's, that's the I kind don't. of stuff that I'm talking about. Well, I, I thought the exact same thing. Uh, when Charles Pogue went across that about John the baptizer and Jesus both saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he said that didn't that did not mean 70 A.D. And I'm going well. Then what did it mean in James five? What did it mean in First Peter chapter? Interesting. Four? I wrote what did down it mean the in Hebrews. Done. I just have to stop. I have to interrupt you. Those were the first two yeah. texts I wrote. So we we basically <laughs> were on the same train of thought. First text I mentioned was James five and First Peter four. Uh, you know, that was enough for me. I didn't go any further, but I could have written them all. But go ahead. I, I just had to tell you. Yeah, that. well, there's no need to. It, the, as you said, the, the total inconsistency of Charles Pogue to get up there and say, at hand means at hand. And then, of course, he tried to say it, it can't mean later, even in that same generation. Well, who said so? You know, I, and then to ignore... All of those texts, and look, William, you and I both know there's almost undoubtedly, almost undoubtedly, someone sitting in that audience going, well, wait a minute, Brother Pogue, uh, what about those passages that says the coming of the Lord was at hand in the first century? What, what are you going to do with them? And, and yet they don't have – they certainly could not, absolutely could not say anything – at that lectureship for fear of being completely kicked out and ostracized. But you, you made a point there earlier, William, that it, basically if, you, if you've listened to one of those speeches, you've listened to all of them. Now, certainly there are some nuances in each one of the presentations, but there's a commonality among the speakers. Number one, a commonality of arrogance of attitude. That is just so unfortunate that, and there's a commonality of thought that absolutely they just cannot be wrong under any circumstances. There's a commonality of completely and totally ignoring the the totality of the testimony of Scripture and taking what I have called in the past and what others call an atomistic approach to Scripture. They, they think if they've got one single verse that seems, it does it on close exegetical examination, but it seems on close, uh, or it seems on a casual reading to support their view, so all of a sudden that's it. That's all they need. And then to, my goodness, uh, I well, you said you took about four points. I've actually got... Uh, a page and three quarters of notes. The thing that struck me, as has struck me with every speaker at the Bellevue Church of Christ, is the superficiality of the approach. And 
how those men, if they were debating a dispensationalist, now, uh, this is ironic. Charles Poe got, got up there and said, you know, this lectureship book, the Bellevue Church Christ lectureship book, uh, can be used to refute the dispensationalists because the dispensationalism and preterism have so much in common. I'm going, well, that <laughs> proves you've never studied covenant eschatology. Nothing could more powerfully illustrate and prove that Charles Pogue has not spent any substantive time studying, actually studying covenant eschatology, than to stand up in front of that audience and say that dispensationalism and covenant eschatology are very, very similar. Oh, really? In what I just, uh, you know, that type of thing, uh, you know, it, it amounts to no, nothing more than setting up a straw man. You can't do exegesis. So you just set up a straw man, and you attack the straw man, and then you declare victory. When in reality, you've done nothing. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that the dispensationalists will tell us that we're teaching false doctrine, and they don't want to debate it anymore after they entangle with it. The amillennialists will say we're teaching false doctrine, but they don't want to debate it anymore after they've had to deal with it. The partial preterists will say we're teaching false doctrine, and they don't want to debate it anymore after they've been involved with it. <laughs> and I'm seeing the same thing with pretty much all of them. So why is it that they all have the same thing in common that they all say, and, and see, that refutes what Charles Pogue is saying, uh, in, in trying to align us with these other people, because all the rest of them say, no, we're not preterists, we don't believe that stuff, uh, that's wrong, etc. And yet, at the same time, all of them are in unison in saying it, and they're also in unison in saying, we don't want to debate them anymore. <laughs> and speaking of which, I have to share this, William. Today, I got booted off of a Facebook page uh, <laughs> entitled Amillennialism. <laughs> and a couple of weeks ago, I had requested permission. Now, I had been invited. I had been invited to join that that Facebook page, yep. so I did. I didn't want to go on there and just be like a bull in a china closet. So I would just read a little bit. I would observe and what have you. I made a few rather innocuous posts, and a couple of people liked my post. And so I guess it was last, perhaps, I contacted one, the owner of the board, and I asked permission to post a debate challenge. As you know, William, we have next year coming up on our Predators Pilgrim Weekend, and our theme is, what's wrong with all millennialism? Okay. So... Um, we're wanting to have a debate with an amillennialist, a representative amillennialist next year at Predators Pilgrim Weekend. So I contacted the admin and the owner of that board asking for permission to post my challenge for a reputable, representative, and respectful amillennial leader, speaker, to come to Preterous Pilgrim Weekend and to debate amillennialism with me in 2016. He granted me that permission. So I posted the challenge. My goodness gracious. The response to that was everything except, hey, this is great. Let's get a champion. Let's get a debate uh, lined up with Preston. It is like... Why was this man allowed to come on our board? This stuff is heresy. Uh, this is an embarrassment. The, the admins ought to be ashamed of themselves for even allowing this man to be on here. On and on and on. Well, one gentleman, and I use that term gentleman very, very loosely, uh, finally took up the challenge, if you please, not to debate me, but to address what I had been saying. Uh, Stordahl, uh, Gregory Thomas Gregory Stordahl is his last is his name. 
if I remember correctly. And William, you, I think I've shared this with you with you privately. Here is a guy who says he's an all millennialist, but at the very beginning of the discussions, you know, and okay, so he's supposedly an all millennialist, and all the men on the dais at the Bellevue Church of Christ lectureship, they're all millennialist, and yet this guy comes back and he said, well, I'm what they call a realized all millennialist. Well, that's kind of a new one on me. I try to keep up with what's going on in, in the theological world insofar as what people believe, what they're being called, et cetera, et cetera. I'd never even heard the term realized all millennialist. And this gentleman said that he believes that we are in the new heaven and the new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. <laughs> he said, we are in the eternal day. He said, the Christian age will never end. Well, you know, William, you and I were raised in the all-millennial world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never heard such a doctrine growing up. That's and right. I can guarantee you, folks, if that gentleman was to stand on the dais, on the platform at the Bellevue Church Christ lectureship and say, I believe we're living in the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. I believe that we're no longer in the millennium. I believe that we are in the eternal day. I believe that the Christian age will never come to an end. That man could never have finished his speech. He would have I'm telling you right now, Michael Hatcher, the director of that lectureship, would have interrupted him and said, you're teaching false doctrine. Get down from that pulpit. We will not allow this to be spoken. And by the way, he would have said, you're teaching nothing but covenant eschatology. <laughs> so I formulated the argument. And I'm saying all this, you know, to, to go back to what you just said. All millennialists say that we're wrong, and yet they wind up saying things that wind up where we're at. Precisely. So the argument that I pre the the argument that I presented on the Facebook page entitled "All Millennialism" was this: the Bible teaches that the second coming of Christ, the judgment, and the resurrection would occur at the end of the age, and I gave some of the appropriate text: Matthew thirteen. Etc. But Mr. Stordahl says the Christian age will never end, and that we are in the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22, which means that we are in the endless day that would follow the resurrection of Revelation 20, 10 and following. Therefore, the resurrection and second coming cannot be at some point in time in the future at some supposed end of the Christian age since this guy says the Christian age has no end. So I asked him to respond to that, just as I would ask anyone else to respond to that. Well, guess what? Mr. Stordahl, even though I posted, reposted, and posted a grand total of six times that very argument, guess what? He refused to say even one word. He refused to even use one keystroke in response. Well, it kind of went on like that. He made so many blatant, blatant misrepresentations of what I believe. Uh, no, no, not even any sense in going into them. I, I challenged him repeatedly to document where I supposedly had ever said some of the things he claimed I had, he never offered a keystroke of proof, et cetera, et cetera. And this afternoon, somebody on the board made the mistake, William, of expressing genuine interest in dialoguing with me, and I was immediately banned from the board. <laughs> so here's, here's a board, all millennialism, that number one, I, I even challenged this fella. Prove to me that you are representative of the amillennialism 
of uh, Robert Strimple, William Hill, Greg Beal, Kim Riddlebarger, any of them. Well, he wouldn't even attempt it. And he said, how do we know that you represent the preterist movement? <laughs> we don't even know if you we don't even know who you represent. And he challenged me to give him the names of twenty people that would say that I would represent preterism. So I immediately responded and I said, Tell you what you do. You get an endorsement from Robert Strimple, Greg Beale, Kim Riddlebarger, uh Anthony Hokema, and I named off about four or five other prominent amillennialists. I said, you get an endorsement of your position that you have stated on this board, Christian age has no win. We are in the endless day. We are in the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. You get an endorsement from any of those men, and I'll give you the names of 20 preterists who say that I represent the preterist movement. In a good way. Well, obviously, he wouldn't even, he never even, well, to go back to my statement, he didn't even offer a keystroke to prove that he represented or represents all millennialism, period. And I even challenged the people on the board. I said, I want to make an appeal to everyone on this board that's reading this exchange. Tell me if this man is representative of all millennialism. Not one person, not one person would chime in and say, yes, that's all millennialism. That's what all millennialism is. It, it really was quite embarrassing for this guy, and yet he's the type of person that doesn't even know when he's been embarrassed. He doesn't even realize that he, logic is. Well, you get the same impression, unfortunately, William, I think you'll agree, of so many of the men on the Bellevue Church Christ Lectures. They don't even seem to understand logic, exegesis, or hermeneutic. And, and it's really, really sad when, when, you, when you have to try to not only respond, but when you have to try to analyze what these men are saying. Because, for instance, let, let me give you a, a, an instance of the illogic uh, of the presuppositional theology. Charles Pogue made the comment. He said, if all of the resurrection texts in the New Testament deal with the deliverance from Judaism, and I don't know anyone who says that all of them do, but be that as it may, then how can we know <coughs> that there will ever be a bodily resurrection? We don't, he said. And I thought, okay, you assume that there is going to be a physical, bodily resurrection at the end of time. So what you're saying is, wait a minute. If all of the Bible texts that speak of resurrection are not about a bodily, physical resurrection, then, then how can we prove that there's going to be a physical resurrection? And he goes, but we, we couldn't prove it if all of these verses don't speak of it. And you're going, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if, if no New Testament text speaks of a physical bodily resurrection, then you can't prove the doctrine of a bodily physical resurrection. And, of course, they won't have that. And so they just assume, well, preterism is wrong. But that's the circular reasoning that was on full display in Charles Pogue's presentation. And then, of course, what he did, William, and, and I knew this was going to happen. You knew it was going to happen. He said, let's get into the text. Let's examine John chapter 5, 24 and following. And he said, folks, look, all you have to do is read the text. I'm reminded, William, of a situation right here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, some years ago, <clears throat> in which I was speaking to this gentleman and was pointing out 
that Paul's doctrine of the resurrection is from the Old Testament. And that in order to understand Paul, we have to have some insight, therefore, into what the Old Testament said about resurrection. After all, Paul begins his discussion of the resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 by quoting from, or citing, Hosea chapter 6. Okay? And I then observed that Paul said the resurrection that he was anticipating would be the fulfillment of Isaiah 25, 8, Hosea 13, and 14. And this gentleman went absolutely ballistic. <clears throat> he said, I don't have to know one thing about the Old Testament. All right, Don, I lost you if you're still talking. Um I don't know if you just kind of blinked out there or what. Uh, looks like he, we lost him, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So he was just basically talking about the background of the resurrection doctrine that's taught in the New Testament, that the foundation of it is found in the Old Testament. And, of course, from Isaiah chapter 25, uh, 26, and 27, you will find uh, the text that Dunn was uh, referring to, and of course you can find it in Daniel 12, which is one that I like to use um, in addition to those, especially in referring to uh, Daniel, um, excuse me, John chapter 5, 24 through 29. So if you're going to read that text, I mean, you know, if you get to verse 39 in the chapter, Jesus tells them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And of course, um, you know, it's Daniel who talked about that. Dunn's back, so let me get him back in. But that is uh, precisely, you know, what's, um, you know, what the nature of that situation is. Uh, let's see. see. Now we got him. Okay, you're back, and uh, we lo we lost you right yes. at the time you were speaking about the uh, Old Testament verses uh, that are the foundation yeah. of the New Testament on the resurrection. Yes, and I was pointing out that this gentleman here in Ardmore told me that he absolutely wanted nothing to do with any hermeneutic that demanded that we observe the Old Testament source of the New Testament doctrine of the resurrection. He said, if I cannot pick up 1 Corinthians 15 and read it in exactly the same way, understand it in exactly the same way that I would read the, the local newspaper, he said, I want nothing to do with that kind of hermeneutic. I mean, you know, it's I had just a absolutely stuck. Guy who said the same thing. Uh, you you remember his name? I think it was Buzz something, wasn't it? Um, was that his name? Um, anyway, I can't remember it. But he had a paper that he put out, and uh, he basically said there was nothing in First Corinthians 15 that had anything to do with Old Covenant Israel, or to be more exact, I, I, for those who are not familiar with the term Old Covenant Israel, Israel according to the flesh, which is the way the Bible says it, uh, but it means the same thing. I had to point that out earlier today because it came up as an issue, <laughs> you know, uh, because these people have so much <clears throat> emphasis on, you know, on uh, Torah and, you know, the Old Covenant Israel or, or Israel according to the flesh that they think that that's yeah. the only Israel that's there. So it's important to point that out. But anyway, <laughs> uh, back to what what you were saying. On that view, that's you know <clears throat> well, definitely the idea that they have. Absolutely, and, and what's fascinating is that Charles Pogue, in his presentation, said not one single word about the Old Testament source of the New Testament doctrine of the resurrection. Not one word. Now, what he did do, he said, you know, the dispensationalists and this realized eschatologist. Uh, ha have one thing in common. That is a focus on Israel. He said, you, <coughs> you would think, <coughs> pardon me, you would think Israel is everything to these people. Well, I suppose we ought to let the New Testament writers settle that issue. When Peter said that his doctrine of the day of the Lord, the new heaven and new earth, was nothing but a reminder of what the Old Testament prophets had said, Second Peter chapter 3. Mm -hmm. uh, we could let Peter testify when he said that the salvation that would come at the parousia, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, was the salvation spoken of by the Old Testament prophets 
who knew that they were not speaking of their own day and their own time, but Peter said they, they're speaking of his day and his time, and he, he was interpreting those Old Testament prophecies. I suppose we ought to let Peter speak again in Acts chapter 3, <clears throat> as he anticipated the, quote, restoration of all things, unquote, that was spoken of by Moses, by Samuel, yeah, and all the prophets. In fact, all of the prophets who had ever spoken. And, you know, that's pretty much Old Testament prophets. <laughs> so here's Peter expressly stating that his eschatology was nothing but the but the expectation of the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made in Torah. And we haven't even touched Paul. <laughs> and so, you, you know, uh, the the sad fact is that you have people like Charles Pogue who get up there and they simply quote or they read John five twenty four to twenty nine, ignoring the fact that Jesus's mission was to fulfill the old covenant prophecies. Jesus's entire mission was about old covenant fulfillment. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And, uh, in Matthew five seventeen and eighteen. Then you go to Luke chapter twenty four, verse forty four and following. And Jesus told his disciples, "Do you not remember that when I was yet with you, I told you how all things that are written in the law and Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled? Don't you remember that?" Well, my goodness gracious, according to Charles Pogue and the silence uh, that he exhibited, we don't have to know any of that stuff. We don't have to know anything about the Old Testament. And so it's just, you know, it's just unbelievable, and it's sad. Now, we both understand the mindset that those men are in. They believe that the law of Moses was completely fulfilled at the cross, completely removed at the cross. Charles Pogue said Jesus nailed the law to the cross down toward the end of his presentation. Well, of course, Colossians 2 and Ephesians 2 say no such thing. That's a fabrication, and it's a manipulation and distortion of the text. But nonetheless, that is so foundational to, to their doctrine that they simply cannot conceive of any doctrine, any theology that that teaches, as Jesus did, as Paul did, as Peter did, that they were still looking for the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. So, going back <clears throat> to John chapter 5. Folks, the key argument, the key argument that Charles Pogue made in regard to, to John chapter 5 well, in addition to saying it's it's obviously got to be two resurrections. But he says, notice that it says, the hour is coming and now is. And oh my goodness. He said, and now is. And he paused. And now is. He said, in case you were wondering if I'm trying to emphasize that, I am trying to emphasize that. Jesus said, the hour is coming, and now is. And then, of course, he goes to verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming. And he said, did you catch that? Now, it's a good thing he didn't say, do you catch the power of that? I might have to sue him for infringement of copyright. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, do you see the contrast? The hour is coming and now is versus the hour is coming. He is clearly, Charles Pogue argued, talking about two totally separate times. Well, nobody's denying that there is at least some distinction in time. But to insert 2,000 years between now is and is coming? Where in the world does Charles Pogue come up with that justification? Well, you know, every man on the dais down there would castigate the premillennialists for what they call the gap doctrine, inserting long periods of time into texts where there's no justification for 
insertion of such long periods of time. So what does Charles Pope do? He gets up there and he says, the hour is coming and now is. Oh, watch. The hour is coming. Oh, got to be 2,000 years so far. Where is that in the text? Well, it's based, once again, upon the presuppositional theology unproven by Charles Pogue or any other speaker on the dais that there has to be a physical resurrection of the dead. And, William, you and I will understand that a, a specific given word does not have to appear in a specific text to be included. We understand that hermeneutic, okay? But you would think that if the doctrine of a physical resurrection is a biblical doctrine, you would think that some text, out of all the resurrection texts that are found in the New Testament, mm -hmm. you would even think that some text in the Old Testament predictions of the resurrection would use the word physical, that they would even use the word fleshly. Now, they do use the word sarks as flesh, but as you and I have pointed out numerous times on this program, for Paul especially, the word sarks very, very seldom ever referred to human flesh. Notice in Galatians chapter 3, as he chided the Galatian Christians, and he says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should no longer obey the truth? And he said, you did run well, who have hindered you from now obeying the truth. This only what I know of you. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? It's the Greek word, sarks. Well, Paul's not talking about biological human flesh there. He's talking about going back under law and referring to the law as flesh. And he does that throughout his epistles. He does it in Romans 8. He does it in Galatians. I mean, everywhere you turn in Paul, he uses the Greek word sarx in a sense different from human biological flesh. But obviously, or seemingly obviously, Charles Pogue has no concept of this. And so he inserts the word flesh, or he inserts the word physical into text after text after text after text. Now, again, I understand that a given text, a singular text, doesn't have to have a given specific word. As long as that doctrine, as long as that truth, as long as that reality is unmistakably found in other texts. But we don't find that truth. We don't find that doctrine. We don't find that theology in any New Testament text. So it is eisegesis in the worst manner for Charles Pogue to come along and say there's got to be a physical resurrection. Now, William, Charles Pogue argued that in John 5, we have, first of all, in the hour is coming and now is, we have Charles Pogue saying, now see, this is a spiritual resurrection. But in verse 28 and 29, since they were looking for the hour is coming, that absolutely must be a physical resurrection. So first the spiritual, then the physical. William, is there anything at all wrong with that hermeneutic? Well, certainly there is. Of course, it runs directly opposite to what the Scriptures teach. We covered that, I think, in last week's lesson when we were uh, speaking on the other gentleman. I can't remember that name. Uh, I've slept a couple times. I don't times even remember then. the name. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, it doesn't matter because they're all saying the same thing. Uh, yeah. In first, yeah, First Corinthians, we talked about the natural man, uh, where in in chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of God. That's the Sukikos man. It isn't because he has no humanity, uh, you know, no, no physicality about himself. He is all human as anyone else is. But he is contrasted 
with the pneumaticos man, who likewise is, uh, you know, all human, biological flesh, etc., alive, breathing, has all of his vital signs. So biology is not the distinction between the two. But here's what's interesting in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, which, you know, you brought out before and which the text brings out. It says, but the natural man is not the first man. Uh, or rather, excuse me, uh, yes. that which is spiritual is not first. The natural is first, and then afterward that which is spiritual. So you have the, the natural man, the psuchikos man that was first, and then the pneumaticos man is the one that follows. These guys have a resurrection, and not only they, but Carl Albert as well, had the same, uh, same uh, concept because he was arguing from Romans 8, which is also 1 Corinthians 15, that many of these guys are not even aware of, that Romans 8, uh, he said, well, there was the resurrection of the Spirit, but then he put a bodily resurrection off into the future. That's precisely what the amillennialists do. They've got the same split dichotomization of resurrection and of a physical body concept that the rest of these guys have. And that's why they can't fulfill the resurrection. That's why they can't get these, these, uh, these doctrines to, to uh, harmonize. That, that's exactly right. <clears throat> and what's fascinating, of course, and as you mentioned, we covered this ground last week, so we don't want to belabor to the point, but when you come to men like Charles Pogue, and when they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they take the word natural there to refer to physical. Yes. But then they turn right around and they make the resurrection of 1 Corinthians, excuse me, uh, John chapter 5, <clears throat> they have... They have first the spiritual and then the, quote, physical, which violates their interpretation, their interpretation of natural versus spiritual in 1 Corinthians 15. Because if it is the case that natural equals physical and spiritual means non-physical in 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> then Paul's very clearly saying, then the physical takes place first, then the spiritual. But these guys turn it around in John 5 and say, oh, no, no, we, we have the spiritual first. Then we have the physical. Well, which is it? <laughs> they completely distort their own take on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it would be interesting to get you know, get these guys in a debate and just simply ask them prior to the actual exchange, Please, uh, what do you mean by natural, and what do you mean by spiritual in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul said, that which is spiritual is not first, but the natural? Do you mean by that the following? Do you mean physical versus spiritual? And if they said, yes, that's exactly what he's talking about, the debate for all practical purposes' sake would be completely and totally over. And I can almost guarantee that if it was an all-millennial opponent, they wouldn't even see the train coming. They wouldn't even grasp the incredible significance of the question. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's right. It, uh, it, it's just like asking an all-millennialist and a post-millennialist what is the law that Paul called the strength of sin. I've asked that question. You've asked that question on tremendous numbers of time. I've asked it in both formal debate as well as countless private engagements. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the people say, well, it's the Mosaic Law. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. The Mosaic Law is the law that was the strength of sin. The resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be when the law that was the strength of sin was removed and overcome. 1 Corinthians hey, Don, 15, 55, and 56. Let me interrupt you. I just noticed we have a caller online. He's been waiting for about eight minutes. So I'm oh, going okay. to uh, engage with him, but I just wanted to let you know. So I'm going to engage with okay. him, and then I'll be back, okay? Okay, very good. So right. the, the conclusion to that little argument that I was uh, offering there is, let me repeat the premises again, okay? The law, that was the strength of sin, was the law of Moses. 
the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be when the law, that was the strength of sin, would be overcome, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 and 56. Therefore, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be when the law of Moses, the strength of sin, would be overcome. Now, what that means, folks, is if the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 has not taken place, then the law of Moses is fully in effect. It is still the strength of sin. Wow. What an incredible position that would be and, and is for people to take. And yet, in debate after debate, <clears throat> I presented that argument. I've not had one single debate opponent to answer that this is incredibly important because the, re the resurrection of John chapter 5, the resurrection of the hour that is coming, is the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15. That means that the resurrection of John chapter 5, 28 and 29, would take place when the law of Moses, the strength of sin, would be overcome. When Charles Pogue stood on that dais, on that platform at the Bellevue Church of Christ, and said that the resurrection of John 5, 28 and 29 has not yet taken place, he, he was thereby affirming that the law of Moses, the law that was, that is, that was the strength of sin, remains in effect today. Now, that leads us to a problem. It, virtually every speaker on the Bellevue Church of Christ lectureship said you cannot have two laws in effect at the same time. You can't have the gospel in effect at the same time that the law of Moses was in effect. And you certainly cannot have any one person or any group of people under two laws at the same time. In other words, you can't have them under the law of Moses, and you cannot have them under the gospel at the same time. Well, wait a minute. According to these men, <clears throat> even the most faithful child of God today is under the law that is the strength of sin because, guess what? Sin still brings death even to the most faithful child of God. That means okay. that even the most faithful child of God today even though they are under the law of Jesus Christ, the law that ostensibly sets us free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, the Christian is nonetheless under the law that is the strength of sin because guess what? Every Christian is going to die, i.e., because of being subject to the law of sin and death. And look, folks, I have had debate opponents in such desperation when entrapped by their own doctrine stand up and say, well, the law of sin and death is not still in effect physically. It's just in effect spiritually. Oh, so the law of sin and death is not in effect for Christians, since Christians are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, but Christians still die, which means they're still subject to the law of sin and death after all which means they're subject to the law of Moses. So you have Christians subject to the law of Moses, which is the strength of sin, which, you know, gives credence, strength, and power to the law of sin and death. It allows the law of sin and death to be in effect in our lives, leading to physical death. But then they turn around and say, oh, well, well, no, no, no. The law of sin and death for the child of God is, is no longer in effect applicable Physically, well, then why did the why does the Christian die physically? But they say uh, it, it's only in effect spiritually. Therefore, the child of God, the faithful child of God, regardless of his faith, being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, is still subject to spiritual death. So, what has Christ done for us? This is what William and I mean when we say that there's not a man on the dais. Uh, the Bellevue Church of Christ has a grasp of redemption. They do not understand salvation. They do not understand the doctrine of resurrection. They do not understand the nature of the substitutionary death of Christ. They do not understand the law that was the strength of sin. They do not understand the death of Adam. <clears throat> and yet they get on that dais and they condemn preterists, proponents of covenant eschatology, saying it's more than obvious that John chapter 5, 24 to 29, is speaking of two different deaths. Well, I hope you were paying very careful attention to the points that I just made, ladies and gentlemen, because to take the position that John 5, 28 and 29 
refers to a yet future resurrection, is to deny the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. It says right. we're still under the law of sin and death, and it says we're still under the law that was the strength of sin. William, are you back? Yes, yes, I'm here. And uh, we had a gentleman on the line. He asked the question, and we I know we only have about five minutes left, which means that you don't have time to develop another theme for Charles Pogue tonight. <laughs> so we'll just have to pick <laughs> up on that next week. And uh, we can just get this question in pretty quickly. It was one that he was very much concerned about and would like to know something about. Uh, but that's the beast in Revelation. And I asked him if he were specifically referring to chapter 13, of course, we know that, you know, it talks about uh, more than one in the book of Revelation in terms of, you know, what was going on there. But I think that's the major one that he had reference to. And so um, what he wanted some insights on the beast. Let me say before you respond to that, um, I listened to a piece, uh, just a, a piece where Benny Hinn was interviewing, I think his name is Irving Baxter, who claimed that oh. he could... <laughs> that he could prove that we're living in the time of the second coming of Christ. And the way he was going to prove it, and I'm saying this kind of as a setup for the beast in Revelation 13, was that he could go to Daniel and that he knew that the lion in Daniel chapter 7 was Great Britain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I just, uh, I just thought this, this is crazy. I mean, that's how... It, you know, while some of these interpretations are. They do not understand that the beast that's in Daniel 7 is the same image of Daniel chapter 2. And that's the harmony of Daniel all the way through. But anyway, I'll let you um, entertain it in the next couple of minutes if you can get something in very quickly uh, for the gentleman. Okay. <clears throat> well, in Revelation chapter 13, uh, we have we have the beast who is obviously the composite figure and the reflection, as William just pointed out, of the beast in Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7, which means it has to t take place, and, and this is extremely critical. It had to have taken place. It, the beast of Revelation 13 had to have appeared in the days of the Roman Empire. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel saw four beasts which represented four world empires that would follow hard on one another. And it was in the days of that fourth kingdom, i.e. Rome, that the little horn, having come up through the previous three beasts as well, would become the great persecuting enemy of the people of God. But the key fact here is that the beast is in the days of the Roman Empire. That means you cannot get, by the way, means you cannot get the coming of the Son of Man of Daniel seven twenty one and following beyond the days of Rome, period. Story over. Because Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, only extend to the days of the Roman Empire. Now, here's something I think is equally important that some people today are very, very much overlooking. They want to identify the beast in Revelation as strictly Nero, and I think that's misguided. The beast in Revelation is very, very clearly a composite figure, and I believe it is the very expression. <clears throat> number one, it's obviously in the days of Rome. We've already established that. But number two, the beast, the great serpent, the devil, was already known in Isaiah's day because Isaiah 27, verse 1, foretold his destruction. Well, how did Isaiah know about him if he didn't know about the beast, the Leviathan, the great serpent, who is the enemy of God? And when we look at Hebrews chapter 11, the theme of martyrdom, which is absolutely inseparably connected to the beast in Revelation, the, the martyrs of Revelation chapter excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, go all the way back to creation. They go all the way back to Abel. So what I'm suggesting to you is that while Daniel's vision takes us to the time of the Roman Empire and gives us a vision of the beast, that we cannot say that the beast is only one single individual. The beast in Revelation is in, in reality the very epitome, the very expression the last day's expression of the enemy of God that had persecuted God's people down through the ages. That's why it cannot be restricted simply to Nero. 
Is Nero possibly included? I don't have a problem with that, but I also want to intrigue and pique your curiosity with this, William and myself as well. I have stumbled onto an article in which the author takes the 12 tribes of Israel and their names and their numeric gematria numbers and values as representative of the number of the beast in Revelation. Now, I've got to explore this. I've got to investigate it. I've got to research it. But my goodness gracious, how intriguing is this. And with that, we are out of time. Thank you to the caller for calling in. I hope we gave you enough to think about. To pique your curiosity, may I recommend you get my book, Who Is This Babylon, available on my website, uh, donkpreston.com. In the meantime, folks, thank you so much for joining us for Two Guys and a Bible, a voice you can trust. And with that, I'm going to say good night and God bless. All right. Thank you, Don. And ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in today, we appreciate you very much. We look forward to being back with you on next week. Once again, thanks to the caller. And uh, that is a great book that uh, Don mentioned, so we do encourage you to get a copy of that as well. Um, Check out some of the information on the websites because we've got uh, plenty of information on that. And if you tune back in on next week, we'll probably uh, try to get a little bit more time to respond to that question. Uh, And I just have to say this and put it on the – but Terry Seibert some years ago uh, pointed out um, a relationship to Israel in that number. And I think that's very, very interesting because that's certainly the the position that I take. But anyway, with that, we're saying good night, God bless, and we'll see you on next week. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say, have a very pleasant day, and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.